The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles, they're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. Volkswagen, Fiat, Mitsubishi, they're all household names now, but they made those names as war factories. Gotta get back to work. This is the story of two guns. One would revolutionize the way we make things, the other would revolutionize revolution. But behind their success lay a very simple concept. They were incredibly reliable. You could use them just about anywhere. They would keep firing, whether it was in the desert of the American West, the jungles of Vietnam, the mud of northern France. The weapons just worked. You've got to be absolutely damn sure that if it does break down, you can fix it yourself right on the spot. And that's what these guns do. Colt and Kalashnikov, two iconic names that conjure images of showdowns and revolution. But behind their success lay factories. When you think of Colt, you think of the Wild West, but you shouldn't. You should think of assembly lines, factories, and mass production. From the Cold War struggle in Berlin to far-flung places such as Vietnam, the Kalashnikov was used by all. Because these guns wouldn't just change the nature of warfare, they would change the world. Sometime in 1830, on board a brig bound for Calcutta, a young man called Samuel Colt had an idea. The story goes that Colt was just 16, and he's persuaded his father to let him go to sea, to study navigation firsthand. And it was there that as he was watching the other sailors use something called a capstan, which is essentially a rotating device to pull in sails, he was struck by the way that the revolving mechanism had a lock which stopped it from winding in reverse. Colt recalls that he had his great insight. What if he could use that same rotational mechanism for a revolver, for a new kind of gun that would revolutionize repeating weapons and maybe make him a large amount of money? So every moment of his spare time on that voyage, he sits down and he whittles a model prototype out of wood. And so the revolver was born. But the truth behind the myth is very different. That's the romantic version. The historical reality is that various other inventors had actually beaten Colt to at least some of his ideas. Importantly, the revolving pistol. And this example, made by a guy called Annerley, 150 years before Colt got things going, is actually an eight-shot revolver. So if you're looking for firepower, it's even more firepower than a Colt. You simply cock the gun and the cylinder revolves. It's just like a Colt revolver in that respect. So Colt was definitely not the inventor of the revolver. His genius lay in borrowing existing technologies and combining them together. But just as critically with him was his marketing genius. You have to remember that Colt was a salesman and he was as, as interested in telling a story about his product as he was in selling you the product. He wanted a narrative, he wanted an origin story. And, and so he wove this great moment of insight while he was at sea as a teenager. The Annerley revolver was not very reliable, which is why we've hardly ever heard of it. But the problem it was trying to solve was one which had bedeviled firearms since their invention. At the beginning of the 19th century, this is what you're armed with as a cavalryman. 
is you only get one shot. To make up for that, he's got two. Draw one, fire one, draw two, fire number two. But that's really it. And that leaves you pretty much thrown back in time to the medieval period. Not much different than a medieval knight, uh, different shape of blade, but nonetheless, it's a sword. If you could invent a weapon that fired quickly, that fired multiple shots uh, much faster than the others, you would have not only a great advantage on the battlefield, but if you were trying to sell it, you would have an enormous advantage in the business world. Colt had the idea for the weapon, but he needed money to get his new invention off the ground. The story of how he went about getting that money is almost crazier than the actual story of the weapon itself. The thing we all got to know about entrepreneurs is that they don't let anything get in their way, or at least no decent entrepreneur. And you know, these are the kind of people, you know, they don't, they don't just make lemonade out of lemons. What they do is they invent a lemon press <laughs> and then they figure out how to bottle the stuff so they can sell it to people by the million. Um, and if they don't have the money to do that, then they come up with a creative way of making money. What Samuel Cole did in an incredibly entrepreneurial fashion was he started touring the country and he sold people hits of laughing gas. And then what he does with all the profits he makes from his roadshow, he sinks them into hiring a gunsmith to build his prototype. And he uses that to take out a patent for what's called the Colt Patterson Revolver. On the 5th of March, Colt's patent arms manufacturing company was born and Colt built a factory at Patterson, New Jersey. But it didn't go well. Colt turned out to be better at the road show than he was actually at the production of the revolver. You're trying to sell a whole load of new stuff, new ideas to your client. And it was just too much um, for the US government, especially the US military, who actually would have to issue these things. At one point, the U.S. Army actually said that the revolver was too innovative and thus it would be dangerous to buy. He's managed to sell a few firearms during the Seminole Indian Wars in the late 1830s, but it's not enough to keep him afloat. And in 1842, he goes bankrupt. But those few firearms would eventually make Samuel Colt's fortune. Sometime in 1846, Colt had a meeting with a U.S. cavalryman called Samuel Walker, which would change his destiny. Walker believed that Colt's revolver had actually saved his life. His units attacked by um, 70 Comanche Indians. His men are able to fend them off because they can fire so many shots so quickly. The fact that the Colt patent revolver could fire five shots without reloading saved them from being overrun and killed. Had they had the single shot pistols, it would have been two shots and done. Walker suggested a few improvements, which would transform Colt's gun. We have two pistols here. This is the original Colt, the so-called Colt Patterson. It's a very technically sound design. Uh, it's rather small, as is very obvious. So when Colt comes back, he comes back big, what's called the Colt Dragoon which is what we have here. Right away, you can see the difference. Very small, very large. And it's not just about looks. Um, the size really does matter here. Bigger size means bigger caliber, a bigger bullet. It's gonna do more damage. A much bigger cylinder means a much bigger charge of gunpowder behind it. Faster bullet, harder hitting bullet. That's critical. The larger cylinder also means you can fit in one more shot, because five shots is good, six shots is even better. Times two, two pistols, gives you 12. Uh, really quite a leap forward. So for the time, this is the ultimate cavalry weapon. Thanks to this new design, the US government ordered 1,000 Colt Walker revolvers. Colt was able to raise the money to build a brand new factory in his hometown of Hartford, Connecticut. But this wasn't just any old weapons factory. This was something the world had never seen before. Now, it's often said that actually the first ever mass-produced object was the gun. Now, there's some people who say that it really might have been the clock, 
Uh, but the one that we know that was perfected was the gun. And the man at the forefront of this, none other than Colt. Because actually what he did was to hire an organizational genius called Alicia K. Root to run his factory. And what they created was essentially the world's first assembly line. Colt's factory was 500 feet long and 60 feet wide, and it was filled with a variety of machines to build each part of the revolver. So you had different areas of the factory floor doing different tasks, and then the gun would effectively come together down a production line, just like a modern factory. 80% of the work was done there in the Hartford plant on these enormous machines that are driven by steam. There were machines that bored out holes in the cylinders for the bullets. Then you had machines that bored the barrels, and then you had machines that fashioned the whole firing mechanism. There were machines for every part of the revolver. All of these individual parts being put together by this enormous workforce. To assemble the gun that Colt had imagined. What that does is streamline manufacturing to the extent that parts can come from all over a workshop floor, and they simply descend on one person who assembles the final firearm at the end with parts that are interchangeable from everything that was made inside that factory. Colt's factory was one of the first sort of war munition factories in existence. It's not just that the revolver was innovative, it's that the factory itself was a new thing. What we're looking at here is a classic assembly line. You know, we think assembly line, Henry Ford, Model T cars. I mean, this is way before that. Colt was doing it decades before in Hartford. Colt's Hartford assembly line churned out 150 guns a day. Cheap, fast firing and dependable, their reputation for reliability was built on one very simple concept. Before Colt, if you have a gun and part of it breaks, you have to go to a gunsmith who will make a part that will work purely and only for your gun. If you take it out, it won't work in another gun, even if it's the same broad kind of gun. By contrast with Colt, what you find is that if you take the rotating barrel out of one Colt and put it into another Colt, it will work perfectly well. The part is identical. This may seem easy and obvious, but it took genius to produce. The challenge is that uh, producing the machinery that will produce the interchangeable parts in the first place is technically very demanding. Just to put it in perspective, during the 20th century, long after the Industrial Revolution, when assembly line production techniques are in full use, there are times where multiple manufacturers are producing one firearm and parts won't interchange. But the truth behind the sales pitch is very different. Because what I'm holding in my hands is a reproduction, the modern replica of the 1851 Navy revolver made on modern machine tools to modern standards. So it interchanges without a problem. Let's just try that out with original 1851 navies. So disassemble the gun we want to place the part on. Moment of truth, it doesn't go. Not only does it not engage and turn and cock, it doesn't even fit the frame. So if you were to show this to one of Colt's prospective customers, they wouldn't be very impressed. You know what? It's all marketing. Because what Colt is, is a supreme self-publicist. And his genius lies in convincing people that he could achieve the impossible before it had even been done. To achieve that, he's basically got to cheat. He's got to pre-select guns that already fit together quite well, maybe even get a gunsmith to hand file them all so they fit each other. They rigged it, essentially, so that it would look like the parts were interchangeable when they really weren't. This sort of faking of, of interchangeability is a really strong sign of how Colt was as much a salesman as he was an inventor. So in that way, he was kind of like the Steve Jobs of his day, selling this whole idea of the technological revolution long before he had actually achieved it. And he convinced people to pay him to make it a reality. Once it was a reality, Colt was quick to protect his investment. Samuel Colt is a great entrepreneur, but he's also one of the world's first and most prominent patent trolls. 
Uh, he patents his innovations as almost as soon as he makes them, and he then spends an amazing amount of time throughout his business career suing people who have violated his patents. The very name of the Colt company to this day is Colt's Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company. Um, and they don't just maintain that because it sounds old world and, and fun. In the early 19th century, when everyone is inventing all of the technology we now take for granted, it's absolutely essential to not only file patents for your novel designs, but also to have a team of lawyers going after you if you so much as look like you're infringing on his patents. But what would really make Colt's fortune was the world's first truly modern war. On the 12th of April, 1861, artillery attached to the South Carolina militia opened fire on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, firing the first shots of the American Civil War. it would prove to be the making of Colt. The American Civil War is in some ways the world's first great industrial war, because ultimately it's won by the sheer industrial might of the Union producing more men, materiel and guns than the Southern Confederacy. And many of those guns were provided by Samuel Colt. And not only do you need a hundred of these, a thousand of these, you need tens of thousands of these weapons. And this is an enormous opportunity for Colt. You have a guaranteed source of, of demand by the US government. You can then plan on producing mass amounts for numbers of years. By this point, Colt was so wealthy that he had created his own workers' city around the Hartford factory, Coltsville. Coltsville, in many ways, was like the Google or Apple campus is today. What it was was a kind of self-contained city within the bigger city of Hartford. And it's got its own ferry boat, it's got its own shops, railway depots, school, recreational facilities. It was this giant open area of land with sculpted terrain that had wildlife like deer and peacocks. And it's even got its own church and a social hall for dances and lectures. And this is a big place, it can seat a thousand people. Colt was a man of ideas and those ideas fizzed and sprawled all over the place. He would spend the money to make his workers happy and fulfill his dreams. All of this was designed to attract skilled workers to his factory complex. They worked to a strictly regimented regime. Colt worked his men hard, and he wanted to make sure that they understood they were going to have to work hard. There was a sign over the door to his factory that said, Every man employed in my armory is expected to work 10 hours during the running of the engine, and no one who does not cheerfully consent to do this can be expected to be employed by me. Colt is working these people hard. But Colt was also interested in making sure his workers could sustain their efforts. He didn't want them to just work one day and succeed. He wanted them to be able to work day after day after day. He wanted 150 guns to come out of his factory every day. And the way to do that was to make sure that his workers had the support that he needed. He was one of the first people to create the hour lunchtime for his workers. And in a number of other ways, he made sure that they not only worked hard, but were supported in that work. During the American Civil War, Almost 1,000 employees produced up to 27,000 muskets and pistols a year. By 1863, the company had sold 300,000 copies of the Colt Army Revolver alone. Samuel Colt was an integral part of the Union defeating the Confederacy in the American Civil War. And the Confederacy knew it. On the morning of the 5th of February, 1864, the armory was destroyed by fire. The fire is believed to have been the work of Confederate arsonists. And all that remains of the original armory today is simply the forging shop with dozens of these uh, great big coal furnaces where steel and iron were cast into all the, all the different pieces that made up the guns. You know, pretty hard to burn down a coal furnace. But Samuel Colt did not live to see his beloved factory burn down. And the person who turned his weapons into a truly household name was not a man called Samuel. It was a woman called Elizabeth. <laughs> 
Colt actually died in 1862 of complications of gout. He was only 47 years old. His wife Elizabeth took over the company from him, and amazingly, she was probably a better and more effective leader of Colt Firearms than he was. Because she's living in an age where she can't vote, um, but what she manages to do is to kind of take the reins of this company all the way through to 1901, and she becomes one of the most prominent female industrialists the United States has ever seen. The most famous guns that Colt ever made came not under Samuel Colt, but under Elizabeth Colt. And it seems like Colt didn't really hit its stride until after Samuel was dead. Most of us have heard, I think, of a Colt 45. Uh, it's one of those iconic names in the firearms world. 45 refers to caliber of the barrel, chosen by the US military as big enough to reliably put down a man. It was a, what's called a single action revolver, uh, which means, as we've all seen in the Western movies, you had to cock the hammer back before you then pulled the trigger. The Americans, the cowboys, the gunfighters, anyone that needed a gun grew to love this design and the simplicity of the single action trigger. This is really Colt's legacy. And it soon attracts the marketing name of the peacemaker. Then gets described as the gun that won the West. Most people know what you're talking about when you say Colt 45. Elizabeth Colt turned the Colt 45 into an American icon and she was helped by the unique nature of the American dream. The fact that Colt's product is a firearm uh, is important for success in the American context for two reasons. The first is the existence of, of course, the frontier, where a firearm is a necessity. The other reason, of course, is the uh, veneration of the right to bear arms as being written into the US Constitution. The fact that civilian ownership of firearms is written into the American Constitution ensures that people will be armed as they move out into the frontier, as they move into the West. And they are more often than not armed with a Colt firearm. The United States is a continental-sized country. Now, what this means is that in an area the size of Europe, there are no internal barriers. So if you have a product which catches on, it's going to sell to this enormous geographical area. Colt democratized the ownership of commercially produced firearms for a general shooting public. He not only made the guns that armed the Army and the Navy and the Marine Corps, he armed the guns that were carried by frontiersmen as they went west. These are guns carried by these really iconic figures of the Wild West, you know, Wyatt Earp, Jesse James, Wild Bill Hickok, and they're all their you know, firearms came from these factories at Coltsville. Colt's advertising even ran, God created man, Colt made them equal. And as World War loomed at the start of the 20th century, two names synonymous with the evolution of firearms would get drawn into the story of Colt. One would make the Colt 45 the most famous handgun in the world. The other would give its name to the machine gun. To win a war, it's often said you need boots on the ground. And it doesn't matter how many tanks, how many planes, how many ships you've got, if those poor bloody infantry grunts don't take that hell and hold it for you, you can't control the territory you need and you don't get the resources that you need for victory. The most basic part of an army is the individual soldier with their individual weapon occupying their individual part of ground. You can't fight war without the soldiers, and soldiers can't fight without their weapons. The kinds of guns that Colt was building was absolutely necessary to the wars that the United States fought in the 19th and the 20th century. General George Patton was famous for carrying an 1873 Colt Peacemaker in a holster on his hip whilst leading his tanks. But he wasn't the only US soldier carrying a Colt 45. So for many people, this is still the iconic Colt 45 from all of those Westerns. But there's another equally important Colt 45, and this is it. Designed in 1910, 1911 by a genius gun designer called John Moses Browning. It's actually the government model of 1911, designed for the military. Still 45 caliber, still had that great big bullet coming out the end. 
but a completely different design. It was incredibly reliable, often firing thousands of rounds between malfunctions. And unlike the revolvers that the Army had used, it was actually a semi-automatic, which meant that once you fired a bullet, it automatically reloaded the next one and was ready to go. It was exactly the weapon that the Army needed. It's so reliable, it's still in use during the Korean and Vietnam Wars decades later. And people absolutely love it. I mean, even soldiers and civilians. And you can see this iconic gun in unit photos from the First World War. You know, these are men who once would have been posing with swords or rifles, and they've now got, you know, posing proudly with their Colt M1911s, you know, held across their chests. The Browning Colt 45 would arguably become the most successful handgun in the world. I mean, the numbers are huge, because by 1918, you've got over 425,000 M1911 pistols being sold. And by the end of the Second World War, that number, of course, is going to go even higher, and it goes to well over a million. But Colt wasn't just famous for its pistols. Its factory was at the forefront of another revolution in weapons design, made infamous by the First World War, the machine gun. So at the same time as you've got Browning designing this whole new breed of pistol for Colt, you've also got the Vickers Arms Manufacturing Company in Britain buying out Hiram Maxim and was converting his famous Maxim gun into the Vickers machine gun. The Vickers design for a machine gun was in fact so good that rather than create its own version of it, the United States brought the design over to America and actually handed it over to the Colt company to build. Colt eventually produces more than 12,000 Vickers guns. They initially struggled to provide enough weapons in time for America's entry into the war in 1917. And actually, in fact, there were so few operational Vickers guns in service by 1917 that you've got new recruits being forced to train with dummy wooden models rather than the real thing. Not ideal, frankly. Demand was so great that Colt expanded its factory and employed large numbers of women to help in the war effort. If you look at photographs of the Colt Hartford factory during World War I, you see large numbers of men and women building M1911 handguns and the Vickers machine gun. It's an enormous project, it's an enormous factory. During that time, you got Hartford's industrial population growing massively from 20,000 to 30,000. And then you've got the yearly factory payroll jumping from about $14.5 million to $45 million. So it's basically trebling. But the Vickers was just the tip of the iceberg. During World War II, Colt also manufactures another firearm designed by the great John Moses Browning, a firearm called the ANM2 50 caliber machine gun. Every B-17 bomber or B-24 bomber that's in the sky is flying with a and 250 caliber machine guns. Every P-51 Mustang or F-6F Hellcat or F-4U Corsair, they're flying with a and 250 caliber machine guns. It's the true unsung hero of firearms production throughout World War II. And yet another truly revolutionary design by John Moses Browning would help carry America into a whole new era of infantry warfare. The collaboration of Colt and John Moses Browning didn't end with the 1911 pistol. They went on to produce together the Browning automatic rifle. 1917, it's the First World War, trench warfare. The Allies are trying to break through, become more dynamic. What Browning was proposing and what the army wanted was essentially an automatic rifle. So a rifle that wouldn't just fire a shot every time you pull the trigger, but would keep firing until you let go of the trigger. Big, heavy, cumbersome, but the idea was you would walk slowly towards the enemy with the gun on your hip, looking where you're aiming and firing, um, probably in short bursts, but you're fully exposed to the enemy. It's not actually the best way to use a weapon like this. And actually the tactics evolved to fit the gun. The Second World War is where this thing really shines by which time um, they've wised up a little bit. The walking fire thing is not happening. We have added a bipod, which is the critical piece of equipment, and a carrying handle, and that's enough to turn this into a very good light machine gun. It already has a 20-round detachable magazine. Press the button, 
out it comes. Fire your 20 shots, slap in 20 more, on you go. That's what you want for a light machine gun. And the troops loved it. All told, this thing is in use from the end of the First World War, from 1918, all the way through to the 1970s, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, more modern, more specialist, better weapons emerge, but this thing is a great jack of all trades. It's reliable, it's bomb proof, um, and it has a long service life. What Colt failed to realize is just what a step change their BAR had brought about. This was the first of a new era of firearms, the automatic rifle. And as Colt struggled to keep up, its star would be eclipsed by a new gun in town. Its name was Kalashnikov. In late 1941, a Soviet tank commander is recuperating in hospital when he hears some wounded soldiers complaining about their weapons. He hears them rabbiting on and they're saying that the rifles they had were old and antiquated and unreliable and there are never enough of them to go around. He felt frustrated that the Germans seemed to have better rifles that could kill more people more quickly than the Soviets did. The commander's name was Mikhail Kalashnikov, an engineer who also dabbled in weapons design. And so he set out quickly after World War II to develop a high-speed rifle. that could be mass-produced in huge quantities, and what was really crucial could be really reliable and could operate in all weathers. And what he comes up with is the AK-47. That's the story. The truth is a little more complicated, and it has to do with factories. During World War II, the Soviet military was fighting with a number of different types of firearms. Rather than have one factory producing bolt-action rifles and another factory producing pistols and yet another factory producing this version of the submachine gun, they wanted something that could do it all. They wanted to make one firearm for everyone. Their solution came from a very surprising source, the Nazis. As the war progressed in 1943 and 1944, the Red Army began to encounter an entirely new kind of weapon under development by the Germans, the Sturmgewehr, or automatic rifle. What the Germans realize, pretty much for the first time, when they invent literally the assault rifle, is that you need a rifle that's kind of dialed down a bit. And when the Soviet high command get wind of this, they go, ah, this could be the solution to our problem. So they launched a design competition. And in comes this really promising model. And it's from this young designer called Alexei Sudayev, who's developed automatic weapons for the defense of Leningrad. But unfortunately, he has a fever and dies before he can actually take this forward. So the Soviet high command passes his notes onto a design team led by one Mikhail Kalashnikov. In 1947, they introduced a prototype. Its design was quite surprising. I mean, let's face facts, the Kalashnikov is <laughs> incredibly rough and ready. It's got bits and bobs sticking out all over the place. It's not that smooth, streamlined shape of a traditional military rifle. Notably, you've got this gigantic curved bit of metal sticking out the bottom. You've got cheap-looking sheet metal all over the thing. It's no wonder, then, that when the American military got hold of a copy to evaluate, they were less than overwhelmed. They're really not impressed at all. You know, its individual parts are, are, are really quite heavy and they're fitted with really very loose tolerances. They were interested in the accuracy or lack thereof. They tested these things and they found them not accurate outside of 100 yards. But the evaluators were missing the point. Every ugly little detail is a deliberate part of the AK-47's design. Good gun design isn't just about creating a really accurate weapon. It's about creating a weapon that is just so reliable and cost-effective that you can put it into the hands of just about any soldier, no matter how much of an idiot he is, and they know how to make it work. <laughs> 
the sites are quite close together. Again, the Americans would have looked to scouts at this. Sites further apart are more accurate. You can more precisely align them. Sites close together mean you can very quickly bring up the rifle, sight in your target and pull the trigger. And the magazine is curved. Well, that's there to account for the tapered shape of the cartridges. They pass smoothly up and into the action and are then thrown out with great force when they've been fired. That was a key design feature, actually, to have 30 rounds on the weapon and not have to reload. 30 rounds is three times what military rifles were carrying at that time. In truth, the Avtomat Kalashnikova 1947, or AK-47, was the product of a long, drawn-out process involving several different designers. But the Soviets wanted a better story, so Mikhail Kalashnikov became a hero of socialist labor, and his odd-looking gun became its savior, specially designed for the unique needs of the Soviet soldier. Freezing icy, snowy conditions, muddy, wet conditions, boiling hot conditions. The Soviet Union's territory encompassed all of these at different times of the year. For an effective military weapon, you need it to, to keep running in all of those conditions. And you've got to be able to fix this thing right out in the middle of nowhere, and there are a lot of middles of nowhere in Russia, and you don't have factories for thousands of miles. This thing feels quite wobbly and loose and rattles when you move it around. It has designed in uh, loose clearances between parts. So if mud, sand, dirt gets in there, it's liable to keep functioning regardless and to just ignore it and carry on. And that was designed in from the start. Kalashnikov becomes a superlative for rugged dependability. Everywhere and always people recognize that the AK-47, it will just run and it will never fail. More importantly, this is a weapon that can be easily mass produced so that you can equip your entire army. You no longer have this soldier armed with a rifle, this soldier is armed with a carbine, this soldier is armed with a submachine gun. Everyone carries the same type of firearm. And for the Soviet Union in the aftermath of the Second World War, that firearm was Mikhail Kalashnikov's AK-47. This need for mass production led to the adoption of an unusual production technique one pioneered a century earlier by another gun designer, Samuel Colt. The Soviets spent a decade figuring out how to use one sheet of metal where you simply just stamp or you cut a piece in the shape of a gun. You bend it under great pressure into a U-shaped box and you bolt all of the other bits you need, screw, rivet, all those bits, onto the sort of core of the gun. And of course, what this is doing is to cut down the cost of labor and raw materials so much that the average price of an AK-47 can be little more than about three to $500. I mean, that is dirt cheap. More than 100 million copies were made, spread across the military and insurgent forces of at least 106 countries. And it's a game changer. What the AK-47 as a technology does is to give an enormous boost and an advantage to insurgent forces rather than the forces which are trying to maintain the established order. I mean, it's so ubiquitous, even some countries have it on their flags. In this way, the AK became a factory for insurrection. And nowhere was the AK-47's disruptive power more obvious than in Vietnam. What you've got are these kind of local farmers, you know, not properly trained, but they're armed with this rifle that shows the Americans that their M14s are incredibly cumbersome in jungle warfare. Eventually, the US military came to the conclusion that they needed a lightweight, fully automatic rifle of their own. They were going to have to invent their own Kalashnikov. So what Colt does is to team up with Armalite to create the now iconic M16. Now, the M16 is air-cooled, it's gas-operated, it's a magazine-fed assault rifle, and, of course, it's a lot more sophisticated than the AK-47. So, really, what we have here is a piece of precision design and engineering. It's wonderfully light, uh, beautifully made, latest alloys and, and polymers and all of that, great. There's only one problem. It doesn't work. The early models of the M16 were always sort of kind of clogging up and jamming in the jungle atmosphere, which is obviously really sort of fetid and sticky. 
and the soldiers simply saw it as a liability. The ultimate insult, um, there's a story of a gunnery sergeant walking through a camp. He's got an AK on his back and a lieutenant colonel remarks, what are you doing carrying that gunny? And his response is, because it works, sir. Soldiers were picking up Kalashnikovs because the M16 was letting them down. One can argue that one of the reasons the communists won the Vietnam War and the Americans lost was because of the more reliable Kalashnikov. Eventually, Colt managed to fix the issues with their gun. Once those problems were resolved after 1968, they went away forever, and the M16 is a completely reliable weapon system. In fact, it's one of the most reliable weapon systems out there. But there is another reason why the AK-47 was so popular. Since it wasn't patented, you didn't have to pay for a license to make one. And that was very deliberate. From soldiers guarding the Berlin Wall and preventing East Germans from escaping, to people in Africa fighting for their independence from colonial powers, to countries in the Middle East, this is sort of the long arm of communism. But as the Cold War played out across the world, the inventors of the AK-47 would discover they had unleashed a Frankenstein's monster. The massive risk, of course, in proliferating your own weapon around the world is that the people you give them to might not necessarily agree with your outlook on things. Soon the guns were being used by guerrilla groups against the very governments that produced them. So we see in countless places, but um, notably in Afghanistan, those same Kalashnikovs that are provided to local fighters get turned on the Soviet troops when they come in in the late 70s. Mexican drug cartels or a more established group at this point, ISIS, they're all relying on AK-47s. So this Soviet invention is with us to this day. The AK is estimated to have caused an enormous amount of deaths. And in fact, it's often said that it's actually meant to have caused more deaths than artillery fire, airstrikes and rocket attacks combined. Now, you know, some people think that actually probably about a quarter of a million people a year are gunned down by bullets that have come out of Kalashnikovs. One could argue that the factory that developed the Kalashnikov is one of the most successful ones of all time. It may not be a happy sign of success, but it certainly has proved um, the durability of the Kalashnikov. Colt and Kalashnikov, two names synonymous with death. One democratized gun ownership, the other democratized resistance. Both have changed the way the world works.